Okay, I think that um, we're going to make a start now. It's Monday after the Thanksgiving. Um, I realized that it seems like my internet comes and goes. So just to be on the safe side, I'm going to stop sharing my own uh, video and we'll just do the screen sharing. Um, I'll, I'll make sure if you have any questions to come back with a face. Um, so I hope everyone had a good break for the Thanksgiving and had a chance to kind of catch up on family time. I think that uh, past couple of years now that we're approaching have been so extreme that it's, it's uh, important that we make use of that time as well. So what I was hoping to do today was to go through the study guide for your last exam, which is going to be the exam four. And that's going to cover the chapters from 10 to 15. But really, our big focus will be on the chapters 10 and 11. And I've uploaded the study guide there to the, uh, to the Blackboard. So you should be able to find it. And I'm just scrolling at the same time as I'm speaking. Um, above the lecture exam four. So it's there available for you to download. And what we're going to do today follows very much of the format what we've done in the past. So we will simply be working through that. Uh, any gaps, any missing parts uh, that, that we have there. And you know that I really normally don't post a completed study guide anywhere. So this is the one chance in person or at this at the synchronous format or then watching the recording later on to go through it. So if you do need to download a copy of the study guide for yourself or print it or whatever, uh, I'll give a couple of moments for that in case you need to get caught up. And while I'm getting, uh, while I'm giving that couple of moments for anyone who wants to have a copy of the study guide loaded for themselves, uh, I've got a couple of announcements that I want to do. So this week really marks the final week of teaching for this course. So like I said, you have the exam four to complete. There is no cumulative exam. So instead you've taken the material or we've taken the material and divided it into four sections, which you have then covered. Um, I believe that the exam is due on Saturday of this week. So please try to make sure you get that in. Um, the other thing that I had few messages about was a homework quiz uh, for chapters 10 and 11, where we talked about mitosis and meiosis. And in particular, there was one question where we did some matching exercises. So matching certain statements, either with mitosis and meiosis. And uh, there was an error in the way that it was getting automatically graded. So I had to do some rebuilding of that assignment. But as a result of that, what I've done, I've assigned for every student full marks for that particular question. So you should have full marks for that. If you were confused or wondering, it probably was simply because of the grading having switched off to the options that were not correct. I think that there were two statements or two statement pairs where that was the case. So just a kind of a quick heads up. Um, what happens next week? Next week is our final week together on this, this course. And I have assigned there um, a feedback activity. I'm asking you to complete the course feedback. And I'm also ask, uh, offering a chance to take extra credit assignment. However, I would hold off from just jumping into that extra credit assignment yet, because it is my goal that I'll be able to share where you are standing grade wise uh, once the exam four has closed. So I'm trying to keep a rather quick turnaround time so that you know where you are standing with your grade and uh, then give a chance for anyone who has missed anything to decide to take extra 
credit assignment if they so feel. If you have missed any assignments and you're wishing to take part on those, uh, this week really would be ideal for that. So I encourage you just to go in and try to submit. If the system doesn't accept an assignment that you're trying to submit and it's after deadline, you probably have to reach out to me and then we'll work through that together and figure out uh, how to move ahead. So, uh, like I said, I try to share normally with my students where they are standing grade-wise rather early um, so that you have a chance to kind of react to that. But uh, that turnaround time for that extra credit assignment or catching up on any assignments that you have, might have missed or where the grades are not where you're expecting or hoping it to be, that turnaround time is a rather quick one simply because I do have to finalize the grades and get them to the registry uh, quite fast as soon as the semester is over, the teaching for the semester. So keep an eye of the announcements, keep an eye of your messages at the Blackboard. And having said all that, I think that that's a good amount of updates that I can think of. What I would ask you to do if you're present on this session, please post your name to the chat so I can take the attendance from there. Um, so that would be great help if you do that for me. And just because we have quite a bit to go through, I'm going to jump on to the exam for study guide unless there are any urgent questions that you want to ask. I will be sticking around at the end of the class as well, but if there's anything urgent in terms of either about the exam or about practicalities as it relates to this course or end of the course, uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer them also now. Well, I'm not seeing questions coming through. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to jump into the study guide and we'll work together through it. Um, like I said, this is the probably the one time when I go through it and try to answer um, all of the or provide all of the missing gaps on that study guide. So it really is worthwhile to follow along. And like I said at the very beginning, we are focusing and your exam will be focused on chapters 10 and 11. That doesn't mean, however, that the chapters beyond that would be would not be important. Uh, it's just simply that uh, the focus is, is largely aligned on chapter 10 and 11. I think it should say actually here chapters 12 to 15. So I prepared this study guide to you uh, earlier today. So let's start with the chapter 10 and 11. And really, this, these two chapters were looking at the protest, processes of mitosis and meiosis. One thing that we noticed is that um, all cells uh, in multicellular organisms start as a single cell. So it doesn't matter what the cells end up specializing as the organisms, uh, organism develops further or specializes further. The initial starting point is a single cell that uh, everything starts from. So really, this is where the genetic instructions that we have been looking at when we've been talking about the role of the DNA steps in. So every cell where we have DNA contains instructions for every other cell in the body as well. Uh, so what they can do and what sort of functions we might have and what processes are involved. So um, we're going to, on this chapter, focus on the process of cell division. And there's two broad types of cell division that we'll focus. And the first one that we'll focus on is the process of mitosis. And what we saw that mitosis applied to all cells with the exception of the sex cells. So there's a lot of things that we uh, need to go through mitosis uh, that include uh, your just growth as you uh, 
mature, any tissue repair, uh, any tissue maintenance. So we're constantly having stem cells die and they get replaced. I believe that one of the recent studies that I read said that it's about 10 years that a single cell on average in a human body sticks around. So we're all a little dead inside, if, if you wish to think it that way. Well, the big thing was to notice uh, with the mitosis that it related to, like I said, all cells with the exception of the production of the sex cells. And in this process, we always ended up with the daughter cells or the resulting cells that contained 100% of individual's DNA. So the cells that result from mitosis are going to be genetically exact copies with the parent cell that, it, that, that the division comes, uh, division uh, originates from. In terms of the meiosis, which refer to the production of the sex cells, so either producing sperm or producing eggs, uh, whether we're, we have a male or a female. Cell division on these was a little different. One term that I'm introducing here is the term gametes. Uh, so we talk, when we talk about sex cells in general, without specifying, are we talking about sperm or egg? That's the term that we tend to use. And of course, the main role of sex cells is going to be reproduction. And we remember that unlike with what we saw with mitosis, now we're going to have one sperm cell and one egg cell that are going to fuse together. And that's going to result in a new individual. So, so that each one of these cells contains only sufficient amount of DNA so that the new offspring uh, ends up with 100% of the DNA. We need to divide the amount of DNA in sperm and in the egg cell. So each one of those will contain only 50% of the parent's DNA. So 50 plus 50 adds up to 100%. So that's the reason why we need to be very, very careful that the meiosis is completed successfully so that there's a right amount of genetic material in the new offspring. If the amount of genetic material is off, then we end up very commonly with, uh, for example, with genetic disorders. And I think that I had a video somewhere there for you going through some of the most typical uh, genetic disorders that exist. So that was the difference between mitosis and meiosis. But before we focus too much on those, I do think that it's useful for us just to revisit some of the basic terminology, just to make sure that we have the shared language as we work together. So what we have here is a cell, and each cell, with few exceptions in the body, includes a nucleus. A nucleus is where the genetic material is going to be stored at. And um, at a certain time of the cell division, and we'll talk about that time in just a few moments time, what we'll notice is that the uh, genetic material within the cell actually condenses into this, uh, I've described it as X-shaped, some describe it as H-shaped structure, whatever shape you wish to describe it as. And this structure that we're seeing is going to be our chromosome. So a chromosome is, is something that we kind of frequently end up having to look at. So it's a structure word of knowing. And if we further look what chromosome is made of, we'll end up noticing that the chromosome itself is made of chromatin fiber. So chromatin fiber uh, gets wrapped around these nucleosomes that were these collections of proteins. So um, those are two terms that you might end up seeing you being used when we discuss the structure uh, in, a, in a greater detail. Well, I guess that the one topic that we've spent quite a bit of time on this course, and especially towards the end of the course, 
has been our uh, DNA, discussing about DNA. So DNA and DNA structure has been a focus of ours. And what we saw that DNA is made of a combination of sugar phosphate backbone and then a varying range of bases. And it is these bases that were complementary from one side of the um, DNA backbone to another. So they needed to be complementary pairs. And we'll have a look of that concept in a little more detail as we get further on our review. Um, one thing that I do want to make sure that you are clear as it relates to the terminology that we'll be using, when we are talking about a section of the DNA that codes for a certain protein or certain trait, then we are talking about a gene. So gene doesn't cover all of the DNA. It covers only, you can think of it as a recipe for a certain protein or a recipe for a certain trait that we might see. So uh, when we're referring to genes, uh, that's something that you might want to be clear of so you know know what we're talking about. So we have shared language and we're all talking of the same things. So I think that at large, that is something that we've gone through quite a few times. So should be a rather nice and quick one to catch up on. What I want to shift our focus on is to actually discuss the chromosome structure in a greater detail. You'll notice that I shared the chromosome here earlier on, uh, introduced that, but let's have a look of chromosome in a little bit more of a detail, uh, what parts are involved and so on. So what we'll notice that chromosome is really made of almost like two sticks. These sticks that I'm referring to or I'm talking about, they are going to be our chromatids. So there's going to be two of those. And they are held together from the middle by a structure. Um, and this structure that holds the two chromatids together is going to be our centromere. So those would be, again, useful terms to know when it comes to the chromosome and chromosome structure. When we are starting to analyze uh, genes in particular in a greater detail, one of the things that we'll notice is that the terms locus and allele become very important. So we end up finding on both chromatids within the same location a coding for a particular trait. So uh, we end up finding basically two versions for each trait in a single chromosome, one on each chromatid. This location where these characteristic or these instructions for the trait are coded, this location is known as locus. So you might end up seeing a lot of the literature referring to a particular locus. So that's, uh, that's what we're talking about there. One thing that I think that we had a chance to discuss a little bit and that will become very, very clear uh, as we work further uh, on this review session was that not both locuses always co include coding for a same characteristic of that trait. One locus can contain a coding for one type of a trait, and another one can include a coding for another type of a trait for that same, uh, same uh, characteristic. But how are we seeing? So for example, I think that we used uh, the hairline quite a bit as an example. So you could have either straight hairline or you could have a widow's peak. So these different forms of the gene for a characteristic, such as the hairline, they are known as alleles. So alleles can match at the same locus or they can be different at different chromatids. So I hope that those terms kind of ring bells and come to you quite easily. Um, 
so I think that what I have next is really just kind of uh, expanding a little bit on this allele. And what you saw earlier on when I was explaining it, I used a single letter as an example to show the difference. And what we typically end up doing that whenever we're talking about a dominant allele, so this is the trait that we always see as a visible trait, as long as there's at least one dominant allele in that chromosome. So certain characteristics are much more common than other characteristics. These common characteristics are known as dominant characteristics. And as long as you have at least one allele for that dominant characteristic, we will always end up seeing that as the phenotype for that trait. We can also have what we know as recessive alleles. Recessive alleles refer to traits that are not as common. And typically, only time that we end up seeing recessive alleles is that if you inherit the gene for that trait uh, from both parents. So, um, that requires hitting a gene pool where both parents have given you a recessive allele for that trait. So I hope that that makes sense. And uh, we'll see plenty of examples of that during our discussion tonight. I do want to introduce um, the difference since I keep using the terms genotype and phenotype. And we'll come back to this concept again a little later, but at this point so that we have the shared language so we can kind of carry on all knowing what we're talking about and talking about the same thing. So remember that genotype referred to the genetic coding for a particular trait. So it refers to this, are we seeing dominant, are we seeing recessive alleles? Phenotype instead refers to what we actually end up seeing as that visible trait. So we don't see capital A's and lowercase a's or any other letters. We simply see a straight or widow's peak hairline, keeping with that example that we used earlier on. So phenotype is what we see. Genotype is what's coded in your DNA. And kind of expanding a little bit, we saw that we had dominant and we had recessive alleles. There's a little bit more terminology that I feel is going to be very important for us to be comfortable with. So sometimes we can talk about our uh, alleles for a certain trait being homozygous or being heterozygous. So let's have a look of that concept together. So homozygous refers to the fact that both of the alleles at those locus of the chromosome are the same. So for example, if we had capital A, capital A, that would mean that the, uh, we are seeing same allele on both chromatid, both of the chromatid fibers that make up a chromosome. It could also be, of course, lowercase a, lowercase a, and again, it's the same. So we talk about homozygous uh, pair there. So a lot of the time, what you end up, rather than people talking about seeing, rather than people talking about capital letters and lowercase letters, you end up people describing these, for example, here as a homozygous dominant, or homozygous recessive pair of alleles. Of course, we can sometimes have that we don't have the same on both, uh, lo both of the locuses. In that case, for example, what we see here, we have a capital A and a lowercase a. So if they are different, we're talking about heterozygous uh, alleles for that particular trait. And with the heterozygous, we do not need to specify because we know that we're seeing one dominant and one recessive allele. 
So I hope that that makes sense and that you're, that's kind of aligning with what you can recall from our earlier discussion of this. What I wanted to shift gears on and talk a little bit about was to do with the cell cycle. So the term cell cycle refers to all of the events that take place during the cell's life. So cell, if we use this diagram that we have here, it starts somewhere and throughout its lifetime, it goes through various different stages and some cells end up at the end towards end of their life cycle, dividing into two cells. And if the cell decides to do that, uh, that's really the end of that cycle and the resulting cells are now going to be considered as the new cells and we studied their cycle. So let's have a look of different events as part of a cell cycle and go through those. What we'll notice that we have a letter and number coding, but the big thing here that I want to initially focus on is that we can divide cell cycle into interface and the actual cell division phase. So what you'll notice is that the interface really covers most of the cell's lifetime. And there's different events that take place during the interface. So let's have a look of that uh, in a little bit more detail. But in general, what happens during interface, the cell grows, it grows in size and duplicates the cell organisms, prepares for that cell division. So uh, G1 part of the interface uh, is when the cell really grows in size, the cell organelles increase in number. And this is all kind of preparing for that cell division that will follow. The S interface stage refers to the stage where the DNA is replicated. So we make two copies of two identical copies of the DNA matter in that cell. But we're not doing anything more. We're just duplicating the DNA. And G2 interface, Finally, uh, again, is all to do with the cell growing and getting ready to divide. And that brings us really to the actual cell division stage. And the actual cell division st stage that we see here, that's really not such a significantly large portion in terms of the time of a cell's lifetime. It generally doesn't take a major part of the cell's, cell's lifetime. So we talk about mitosis first, and that really is the division pro includes two, two different parts. So there is the proper cell division, division proper, if you wish, that's a significant part of the mitosis. And the second part of mitosis is the cytokinesis where the cytoplasm and organelles also get divided into two. So all the material within that cell as well. So um, those should be kind of familiar concepts from what we have discussed before. And of course the cell cycle it proceeds to one direction and one direction only. So you saw here I use these arrows to point the direction on this diagram. Cell cycle does not go backwards. However, if there is an error at some point during the cell cycle, we will not proceed any further. We will just stop the cell cycle at that point of the cell's lifetime. So it's kind of our way to make sure that everything gets done correctly, that there's no errors and we just want to keep going on with errors. So to do these checks that everything's going correctly, we have checkpoints. And we're going to talk about three different checkpoints uh, that I've listed here for us. Uh, these are going to be our G1 checkpoint, G2 checkpoint, and mitotic checkpoint. They really refer to the fact where, at what part of the cell cycle, these check, uh, checks are conducted. 
And what we end up noticing is with the G1 and G2 checkpoints that it, sometimes there are errors. Sometimes things have not gone the way we are expecting for things to go. And if there is an error, it doesn't automatically mean that we will just uh, throw everything away. Cell has remarkable capacity to try to fix those errors. And if a fix can be found to those errors to the DNA, uh, in that was manipulated in preparation to the cell division, then we are able to carry on from that check. The other option is if we cannot fix that error, we just simply stop the cell uh, cycle at that point. The mitotic checkpoint, what's important to notice about that is that during mitotic checkpoint, we're making sure that all of the chromosomes in that cell are attached to the spindle. And we'll talk about this structure spindle a little bit more in just a moment. But uh, if we don't have the chromosomes attached to the spindle, there would be a danger that the chromosomes are not divided equally to the two daughter cells that will result. And that would, of course, be a problem. So the mitotic checkpoint makes sure that this need for the uh, chromosomes having been attached to the spindle has been met. And if not, then, of course, we would not want that, that uh, process to move ahead as such. Um, I have discussed with you in the chapter, and there are there is going to be a couple of questions about this in the exam, about certain signals that we use to control the cell cycle. So cell cycle is controlled by a combination of various different things. And what I wanted to do next is to kind of highlight some examples of that. So firstly, let's talk first about the stimulation of the cell cycle. So we can promote the cell cycle to happen. And usually various growth factors, uh, many hormones play a role in that, kind of driving that we keep going on with the cell cycle. We can also inhibit the cell cycle. So if we don't want it to progress as fast, as efficiently, as much, we do have many inhibitory mechanisms. One of those that I discussed with you uh, was when we looked at cells in a petri dish in a lab. So let's sketch that out together just quickly. So what we're seeing here is just a petri dish. So this kind of a flat, large dish where we can have grow cells in a lab. And these petri dishes, what we try to do there is that we offer to those cells everything that they can potentially need. So we offer nutrients, we offer uh, some humidity, we offer heat by keeping them at the nice environment so that the cells have a chance to keep growing and growing and growing. And as these cells grow, there's going to be more and more cells. They will be spreading to all directions, colonizing the growth media on this petri dish. But eventually what we end up noticing is that these cells will end up filling the dish and an inhibitory signal will be shared. So when these cells start touching the edges of, of the dish and they start touching other cells, there will be uh, inhibition, inhibition for the cell cycle uh, that gets triggered from that. So we don't really want the cells to keep growing more than there's resources available. So that was an example of inhibition. Um, we also discussed a little bit in a class, I believe, uh, maybe not in great detail, but I did mention it, that most cells also have a limit to how many times they can divide during uh, a human or during an organism's lifetime. And what we saw that whenever the DNA gets copied in preparation for the cell division, we lost a little bit of that material from the end of that DNA strand. So you can think of it that with every new cycle where the original cells copy is then used for a template for the next cell and next cell and next cell, we're losing a little bit of the DNA. And uh, that's where we had these adaptations 
uh, within the uh, within the uh, DNA itself that regulated that the copies could be made only so many times because otherwise we would end up risking that we lose some of the important information that we are actually wanting to preserve that from that DNA draft. So we're fine losing waste material, but we don't want to lose any actual genes. So those were three different types of control signals as they relate to the cell cycle. Uh, one thing that I wanted to mention briefly is the concept of karyotype. And karyotype was this way of looking at all the 23 chromosomes that we have in the body. And um, what we'll end up noticing that every uh, cell contained these 23 chromosomes, and I'm probably just going to run out of steam and not get them all mapped out, but uh, karyotype was a way to visually study them. And by visually studying these chromosomes, we first of all make them visible and we organize them based on their size. And this is extremely useful for us because from simply looking at these chromosomes, uh, we can get a lot of information. We can look at is the number of chromosomes correct? So if we have too many chromosomes or too few chromosomes, knowing which chromosome we have an extra copy of or which, which one we have a copy missing, that allows us to predict what sort of consequences that would have. We can also look at the size um, and shape of the chromosome. Does it look normal? Are there parts missing? Are there, are there additional parts within each chromosome? If those would be the case, again, that could be a signal that we can actually predict pretty well what sort of issues we might run into later on. Of course, probably the most common use for karyotypes would be to look at our 23rd chromosome pair. And from that, we can see whether the individual will be a male or whether an individual will be a female. So all of those were things that we can actually get uh, information of just by simply looking at the uh, chromosomes of, of a cell line, line up, lined up and uh, by studying them visually. So that's a very common and very successful method of doing initial screening uh, when a couple is expecting for, for a child. So we kind of have a quick screening, what, what that tells in the karyotype of that child, uh, if we are able to collect one cell uh, that's not an important cell that might be shed uh, from that child that's still developing within the uh, mother's uh, body. So that was just a little note about the karyotype. What I really wanted to spend time with you was to discuss the process of mitosis with you. So what I've done here, I've listed the stages of the uh, of the mitosis. And what we're going to do, we're going to visualize, draw what we would see in each of these stages. Of course, we're going to start with a normal cell where we would see the cell shape and we would see the nucleus. But once we are moving to the prophase, which was the first stage of mitosis, what we saw happening was that within that cell, we can see uh, the nucleus disappears. And centrosomes, those two stick-like structures that we talked about uh, when we looked at different parts of the cell, they appear. And attached from the centrosomes, we also have the spindle that appears. And you remember, spindle had an important role in making sure that the chromosomes went to the right ends of the uh, future two cells that we're producing. However, at this point, we do um, see the um, chromatid pairs or chromosomes, but they're floating everywhere free within the cytoplasm of that cell. So they're not organized in any particular uh, meaningful manner. 
Once we move on to the metaphase, we're still seeing that the nucleus has disappeared. We are seeing our centrosomes and we are seeing our spindle. What's an important accomplishment during the metaphase is that now the chromosomes or chromatid pairs line up on a straight line uh, on that uh, cell. So we call this a line that they line up on as an equatorial plane. So uh, all of these chromosomes that will be soon divided into two ends of the cell, they have now lined up nicely thanks to the spindle uh, organizing them. And that happened within the metaphase. The next stage of our process of mitosis uh, includes Actually, we're seeing, getting a little closer of the what's going to be the final outcome. So what we're seeing now is that these uh, centrosomes and the spindles have pulled the chromatid pairs apart so that we're pulling half on each end of the cell. So we're splitting the genetic material to two separate ends of the cell. Another thing that we're seeing happening at this anaphase is that the um, cleavage forms. And cleavage is really this kind of pinching where the cell will be pinched into two. And of course, this is the case in uh, animal cell where we had soft cell walls. In plant cells, where the cell walls are much more rigid, we don't see cleavage forming. We simply see the cell wall starting to cell wall starting to form slowly, growing from one end to another until we end up with two separate cells from that one initial cell that uh, that we had. Um, final stage. Uh, the stage that we're going to call teleophase. Well, what's happening there? Well, now we do have two separate cells. The cleavage has completely pinched off. We have now separated two cells. And uh, the nucleus reappears. So we see a nucleus on each one. So now we have gone from this one initial cell into two final cells. So that was our simplified kind of review of the process of mitosis. So what I wanted to do next with you was to discuss the process of meiosis. So meiosis referred to the production of the sex cells. And we remember that for production of the sex cells, we only needed half of the genetic material uh, on those resulting cells. And we only want to have half. If we would have any more, that would be a problem when the egg cell and the sperm cell fuse together, we would have way too much uh, genetic material. There is, however, another important role uh, for the process of meiosis. And the role that I'm referring to is introducing as much variation to the resulting daughter cells as possible. We want to get as many different kinds of combinations of genetic material to the resulting gametes because one of those might be the ideal one that makes the new offspring, new member of the, uh, of the, the that group extremely successful and uh, kind of hit the genetic jackpot, if you wish. And to introduce variation, we have two different strategies, and we're going to talk about that uh, next. So the first strategy that I want to talk about is uh, that we end up forming synapses. What I mean by synapses is that the chromosomes go come next to each other. So we get these chromosomes uh, coming close by to each other. And the, that was our synapses. The other way how we introduce a variation uh, in the process of meiosis is by actually doing uh, a process where little pieces 
of the genetic material get changed once these chromosomes are next to each other from one chromosome to another. So we're kind of mixing this genetic material, if you wish, from uh, one chromosome to another. And often in the diagrams and textbooks, we show you that happening only at one part at one time. But really, this happens in multiple locations of the chromosome pair uh, at the same time. We just try to keep it simple and just draw one out. And this is because these chromosomes are now laying, uh, lined up, pairing, paired up, and uh, we're exchanging the material. So those would be two important terms when we talk about meiosis to be very clear of the process of synapsis and process of crossing over. Um, what I was going to do next was to draw all of the stages of the process of meiosis out again. Uh, but I am thinking simply because of the interest of time, I'm not going to go and draw stuff that we've already seen. We already went through the process of mitosis. And what we'll end up seeing is that meiosis is not too different from that. So we're going to go through the process of meiosis, but just keep in mind what we saw earlier on. And same things are happening. So we're going to still have those same stages, but there's prophase number one. And the important thing in the prophase number one was that now we're also in addition to the nucleus disappearing, centrosome and spindle reappearing or appearing, we're also seeing this synapsis and crossing over happening. So you remember synapsis was chromosomes coming next to each other and crossing over referred to the part that bits of them get exchanged. So we're mixing the genetic material between the two. We continue through metaphase one, where the chromosomes lined up on the equatorial plane, as we saw uh, in our earlier discussion. And anaphase one, where the chromosome pairs get Split, so we're getting them to the different ends of the cell, again pulled by the spindle. Uh, we also saw the cleavage to start to form at this point. So that was our anaphase one. And of course, in the teleophase one, we ended up with two cells with the uh, nucleus reappearing. So all of these stages have been similar to what we saw earlier on, but now comes what makes the production of the sex cells so different. We're going to go through this cycle a second time, but before going to this second time, there is not going to be duplication of the genetic material. So instead, what would normally happen, we would duplicate the genetic material so that we would have 100% at the beginning and 100% at the end. But instead, now that we're producing sex cells, we're not duplicating that cellular material. So when it's, we're going to go from two cells that we saw here and divide both of those again, we're going to end up with four resulting cells and each of those is going to contain only 50% of the genetic material. The other big thing to notice is that they are not they are not identical to each other. They're all unique or different. And again, remember the whole point why we went through the process of meiosis, that was to introduce this genetic variation. So we end up with resulting cells that have 50% of the genetic material, but they also have a lot of variation in that genetic material. So we can come up with these new combinations of material. So 
that was the important thing to take away from there. So two cycles of cell division resulting in four daughter cells rather than two, and each of those daughter cells contained only half of the genetic material. So I think that that's a really good thought for us to keep on mind as we compare the processes of mitosis and meiosis. So let's talk through those just quickly so that we feel comfortable uh, with what happens in those. So the first one that we had a look of are mitosis, a production of all cells in the body with the exception of the sex cells. We're gonna go through one cell cycle of divisions. And as a result, we're gonna be left with two daughter cells. Well, that means that each of those daughter cells contains 100% of the genetic material. We can sometimes see that being abbreviated into notes as 2N or being referred as containing diploid quantity of the genetic material. And all of these cells, the original parent cell and the resulting daughter cells, they're going to be identical copies of each other. So that was the process that we saw most commonly happening. Well, the production of the sex cells was a little different. We actually went through two cycles of cell division. As a result, we're left with four daughter cells, each one containing 50% of the genetic material. So you can see in literature that being referred as N for the amount of genetic material, sometimes also called haploid cells in terms of the genetic material. And this was all to do that we end up with unique daughter cells. Remember that there was the processes of synapsis and crossing over. And these both contributed to this unique daughter cells that they all were a little different so we got all kinds of possible combinations of of the um, genetic material for the offspring so i hope that that made sense and that was kind of a nice reminder uh, what i'm going to do next i'm going to go through the chapters remaining chapters on this uh, um, material that we have covered for this course. Like I said, we will not emphasize these chapters as much on our exam, but I do think it's important that we still have a look of. So uh, what we've seen so far was that the gen genetic material got passed from one cell to another in the processes of mitosis and meiosis. And this is really useful for us to know that the genetic genes are passed from one generation to another because it allows us then to predict what sort of outcomes we might be left with for a particular traits. So are we seeing certain characteristics in the offspring or are we not? And um, there are some ethical issues that we saw when we looked at this advert where the uh, different people did their uh, did produce their genetic profile to learn more about their background. Uh, there are things to consider such as who owns your genetic information. Uh, if you sign away rights to your genetic information, is that something that we can do? Also, when we're doing a lot of these tests, I'm seeing now for the Christmas, that's always a popular time, uh, tests for all kinds of allergies, but it could be tests for more serious things as well. Well, what if the results are concerning or where there's something uh, that you weren't expecting to see? are we providing proper counseling to explain the results for the individuals who do these tests? Do you have a right if you have agreed that yes, your genetic information can be shared, we can try to find family members, it can be used for research. Do you have a right to withdraw that consent later on? Um, could that even lead into discrimination, for example, in employment that, oh, you have genetic predisposition for certain conditions? A lot of things to think about there. Um, the guy that we talked largely when we talked about the uh, probabilities and how traits are passed onwards was, of course, our good friend Gregor Mendel. 
So what Gregor Mendel did, he was a true scientist. He kept very careful records and uh, he used mathematical knowledge to calculate probabilities of the offspring in terms of how genetic traits are passed from parents to the offspring. What he did, he used God and peas for his research. And there's many reasons why God and peas can be considered as a useful model organisms. So model organisms were uh, organisms that we use to study something that we could see in humans as well. But these organisms are usually smaller, easier to manage, have a quicker reproduction cycle, uh, are well understood. So we kind of might simplify things rather than looking at the complexities of humans. They're easy to manipulate. So we can gain information about humans by using other organisms as models of of uh, what would happen in a human. Uh, what we saw when we discussed about Gregor Mendel and his work that he often referred to these minute particles in his work. Well, the minute particles were, of course, genes. At that time, genes had not been yet discovered. There was no word for it. Gregor Mendel just simply knew that something was passed from the parents to the offspring and uh, these determined what sort of traits we saw in the offspring. So uh, it was quite remarkable that even before something having been discovered, he was able to discuss about it. And I have just included here, uh, we could look a table just to highlight that we could look a number of different kinds of traits, even within just the God and peace. So that gives us a chance to study multiple things uh, in examples that we used in the class and examples that we use in this review guide. We're going to be focusing on one trait at the time, simply because it's easier to explain. But in reality, there would be multiple traits that would be passed on. So one of the tools that we saw when we discussed about uh, inheritance of certain traits and studying genetics of that was known as Punnett square. So Punnett square is this kind of a table that we draw. And Punnett square allows us to map out uh, if we know the adults there, uh, what alleles they carry, we can predict then what sort of offspring we have a chance of producing. And then when we know, can predict what kind of offspring we might end up producing, we can pr predict what their genes are going to be and what their phenotypes, so the visible traits are going to be and how likely each of those are going to be. So uh, it really is a method for mapping out all possible combinations of the egg and sperm and uh, what kind of offspring we might end up with. And again, this is where the terms genotype and phenotype become important. We discussed those briefly earlier on. So the genotype referred to the genetic make of an individual, whereas the phenotype was the actual trait that we saw, of course, phenotype is dependent on this genetic trait. But we do remember, we don't always see all of the genotype. For example, if there are recessive alleles, and these are heterozygous individuals, so they're carrying one dominant, one recessive allele, we would still see only that dominant trait. We wouldn't know that that individual is carrying an allele that's recessive. So that's where the Punnett squares become useful, that we can find out that information. And when we do Punnett squares, we're of course starting with the original parents, and then we're mapping down generation after generation, what sort of genotype, what type of phenotype we might end up with. And what I had on your study guide for you, kind of as a chance to practice a little bit, uh, because I think practice helps to remember characteristics, I asked us to work through a cross where we have one parent being heterozygous and another parent being heterozygous as well for the color of the pea pods of a garden pea. So um, 
this should be lowercase g for the yellow. So yellow ones are a recessive trait. Uh, green pods are a dominant trait. So um, we see more green P pods than we see yellow. Only way that we can see yellow green pods, uh, yellow P pods would be if you inherit the allele for that from both of your parents. And it's just my automated, um, automated fixing of spelling errors decided to change the lowercase g, which was supposed to be for the yellow pods into a capital one. So correct that for your notes if you wish. So let's have a look of this cross. So since we have a parent that has a heterozygous combination, both of them, we map one capital, one lowercase for each one. And then we can start mapping out different genotypes. What would we see? So we get one G from one parent, one G from another parent. In this case, for the first box, it's going to be homozygous dominant. For the second box, we're getting one lowercase from one parent. And from another parent, we're getting one uppercase. So one recessive, one dominant. So it's going to be um, heterozygous. The next one, similarly as before, and the final one, homozygous recessive. So we have one homozygous dominant, one homozygous recessive, and then we have two heterozygous genotypes. So we can list that all out. So the homozygous dominant, we have a ratio of one to homozygous recessive to one, and ratio of two for the heterozygous. So of course, not every parent will have four children, but those are the odds of how likely it is that the child, the offspring of these parents is gonna have the genotypes that have been listed there. Of course, we're not just interested about the genotype, we're gonna be interested also about the phenotype, what we see. And when we're working out what we see, we need to remember which one was a dominant and which one was a recessive trait. So we saw that the yellow pods were recessive and green pods were the dominant. So as long as we have the dominant allele, at least one of them, we're always going to see green pea pods. Only time that we saw yellow pea pods was when you inherited a recessive allele from both parents. So the ratio is going to be three to one in this case for the phenotype. Uh, let's have a look of a little bit of pedigrees. This was another tool that I introduced to you. And what we do with pedigrees, we use them for mapping family histories. It's like a family tree, but usually when we're trying to figure out uh, certain disorders, for example, how likely it is that a child will end up with a disorder. And for reading these pedigrees, which kind of can get quite complex quickly, you needed to know certain rules. So squares are always going to symbolize males, circles are going to symbolize females. If there is a shading that symbolizes that there is a disorder, uh, if there's no shading, that means that that individual does not have a disorder for that trait. And of course, when we had a horizontal line connecting a circle and a square that told that that was a couple and they produced offspring. So offspring was symbolized on vertical lines from these. And there's really a lot of uses for our pedigrees. Uh, and we discussed some of those in the class and some of them we discussed in greater detail in the lecture videos. So I'll just leave it to that. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to finish the two last chapters. So uh, let's just kind of wrap up what we have learned and how we can apply this knowledge that we have learned. So again, we talked about these minute particles. They were, of course, our genes. Or if you wish to write a little more expanded explanation to genetic material, uh, even though the early researchers didn't know 
DNA or didn't know genes, they knew that there were something uh, uh, that they were just simply describing as minute particles, but they were already able to tell certain characteristics of those minute particles. First of all, that they store genetic information, they can be replicated and passed to the next generation, and sometimes there's going to be mutations. So then certain things happen that don't align with our understanding of how genes get passed from the parents to children. And of course, remember that mutations are actually much more common than we think. Uh, most mutations do not have any effect uh, on the um, on the individual that that ends up with mutated parts of the genetic material and some of them might actually even introduce positive genetic variation and this is how evolution works so randomly something good some sort of a better combination of genes better combination or uh, comes about and that makes the individual with that combination much more successful and they are uh, likely to gain more nutrients, be, uh, grow bigger, stronger, become more attractive mate, and when they ha have a lot of mates or when they produce a lot of offspring, uh, when well, then that characteristic becomes more common uh, in nature. So it's really how evolution works through these random mutations. Well, we have talked a little bit about in the class about James Watson and Francis Kirk, and they are usually the guys that you end up seeing in textbooks when we're talking about DNA. And that is because they were the first ones to propose uh, the model for the structure of the DNA. And by having a structure for the DNA, we were then able to explain how the replication process would work as well. And really, without just, if we don't count a few little minor changes that we had to do to their model, it still holds true today. So they did an outstanding job of describing uh, what DNA is and how the processes that involve DNA work. However, we did discuss in a class that, of course, it wasn't that James Watson and Francis Kirk were the first ones to actually see or visualize the DNA structure. Uh, Rosalind Franklin instead had actually taken images of the DNA structure. She just really didn't think too much of that. She didn't think that that was groundbreaking. Uh, and really, Watson's and Kirk's work based on Rosalind's work. So um, I guess that what I'm trying to say that maybe we should give her a little bit of credit for, for what she's done. Uh, and often in textbooks, she gets forgotten. So what I've asked you to do is to explain a couple of terms, important things. So we described DNA as a, with a double helix model or as a double having a double helix structure and by this i mean that we have this sugar phosphate backbone on both strands so they're like the sides of a step ladder and then the individual steps were the bases that connect that you remember that they had to be always complementary so what matched with what and then you take this kind of a a uh, stepladder like structure of the DNA, and you twist it around itself so it forms this kind of a, a helical structure in that sense. So that's what I mean by the double helix structure of the DNA. Uh, I also have discussed with you in the past about nucleotide and the structure of the nucleotide. So let's do that just as a quick reminder for what we need to know when we're talking about nucleotides. So nucleotides are the components that the DNA is made of. So earlier on, I mentioned the backbone. So backbone is made of sugar and phosphate group. And these are really what forms these sides of the step ladder that we saw here. And then these horizontal steps, if you wish, where, of course, thanks to our bases, and bases always needed to match. And uh, bases vary from one nucleotide to another. 
and uh, they could be in DNA, either adenine, guanine, cytosine, or thymine. In RNA, the same ones with the exception that the thymine is replaced by uracil. And there was always this pairing that adenine uh, paired with thymine and our guanine paired with cytosine. And the other way around, cytosine with guanine and uh, thymine with, with our adenine. So uh, that was the molecular level structure of the DNA. So then we just have a bunch of nucleotides uh, together on both sides, and we're able to form this double helix structure of the DNA. Uh, let's compare and contrast a little bit uh, DNA and RNA. So we saw already earlier on a little bit of differences, but let's discuss that a little bit more. So DNA was really like a set of instructions for different things that we can make. And RNA was what we used to actually make something useful out of these instructions. And the useful thing was going to be our proteins. We end up finding that DNA is very stable. It doesn't degenerate as much as RNA does. Uh, I think I used in a class an example that DNA could be viewed as this special collections book in the library that's precious. We don't allow it to leave the nucleus, so nucleus being our library, so we keep it only there. However, you can go and copy information out of that special book, and RNA was this copy of the instructions for a particular protein. Uh, we saw the adenine, thymine, guanosine, and cytosine, the difference within the RNA that we had the uracil replacing thymine. DNA was found only in the nucleus of the cell, whereas RNA was found also in the nucleus, but also outside the nucleus at the cytoplasm. And then ribosomes were the ones that converted the instructions from RNA into a protein. We did talk a little bit about Dolly the sheep in the class, uh, about how she came about, why she says it's an important milestone for our uh, methods of utilizing our, our uh, genetic techniques. That's because she was the first mammal ever cloned from the adult somatic cell. Um, this diagram is something that I kind of wanted to revisit with you, the DNA, RNA, and protein, how these terms are related to each other. And I think that at large, that's things that you are familiar with, but I think it's useful to visit again. So remember, DNA had to stay within the nucleus of the cell. DNA never left the nucleus, but we could make a copy of the DNA. This process of making a copy of the information from the DNA, uh, and this copy is going to be our RNA, that process of making an RNA copy of the instructions in DNA was known as transcription. So you can transcribe something, take notes of something. And then the RNA could leave the nucleus and go to the cytoplasm, where it could then find a ribosome. So ribosome was this structure that paired with the RNA copy. And by looking at three bases at the time, it brought proper amino acids uh, to a chain that was being built to the end of the ribosome. One amino acid at the time. And uh, when we have a chain of amino acids, that gives rise then when it folds and takes the shape that it needs to, that gives rise to a protein. This process of making protein out of the instructions from the RNA is known as translation. So we give a meaning to this information coded in the RNA. And just kind of a briefing of what we'll discuss in a little bit. Uh, I'm going to mention the PCR, so polymerase chain reaction. That's a technique we use to make copies of a particular uh, part of the DNA strand or, or so. Um, finally, kind of to wrap up what we have been looking at, let's talk a little bit about how we can apply our knowledge of genetics or apply in general living organisms, living systems, 
for things that are useful for us in making products. That process is known as biotech. And we have been looking in our class, especially genetic engineering, where we insert genes into an organism that wouldn't normally have those genes. And we turn that organism basically like a factory of making something. And this is how we these days, for example, produce insulin. So whenever we're talking about recombinant DNA, that means that we now have DNA from two or more different organisms. Uh, combined. So some of the terms that we're, we have discussed uh, include vector restriction enzymes, sticky end DNA ligase, and so on. If you're unclear of those, you can refer to the lecture videos. We also talked in the class about the process of PCR. And what we saw is that this was a process with, with, where with each cycle, we doubled the amount of the DNA. Uh, or the sequence of the DNA that we were interested in. And there was that song that I shared with you uh, that if you were really into that, that the lyrics are there. Well, why does this matter? How do we use it? Well, one way we use these techniques is by doing something known as DNA fingerprinting. So just like your fingerprints are unique, also your DNA is unique. It contains varying number of non-coding segments and we can use those non-coding segments and the number of those to figure out what's your unique so-called fingerprint in quotation mark uh, in a genetical sense. So we use PCR when we have found a sample, if, for, for example from a crime scene, and we use the PCR to make ample amounts of that DNA. And then we use the process called electrophoresis, which separates these segments based on their length. So longer segments take longer time to travel through this gel. Sh uh, shorter segments travel quicker through the gel. And however far these segments travel, that's how they show up as these lines on our DNA fingerprints. And then we simply compare and try to find a match between the source and with the uh, suspects if it's a criminal application. Of course, we can use these applications for a lot more than just to solve a crime, uh, detect mutations, combine things, find parent, uh, solve parent issues, and so on. Um, just kind of the last thing that I wanted to highlight and remind you, remember that we have used these biotechnology methods, uh, manipulating which genes get passed on and which don't, and choosing favorable genes for a long time when we have been developing various crops and various plants for our uses. So really the concept of applying that is nothing new. Uh, we're just bringing that to new fields when we're involving animals and so on. A couple of fields of science that some of you might get interested later on. Uh, if we are studying genomes, so genome was all of the genes of an organism. If we're studying those, we're talking about genomics. Uh, we can also study not the genes, but the products that we make out of that. So that would be proteomics and bioinformatics. That should be F rather than G uh, is when we use computer systems to study these large sets of data of genomics or proteomics. So uh, those are some of the applications in as fields of specialism that individuals can go to. And that really completes our review of the study guide. There were a few odd spelling errors or uh, typing errors there. But like I said, what I ask you for the exam for is to focus especially on the chapters 10 and 11. Uh, we have covered all of the chapters for the sake of uh, being consistent. And I think that that should leave you to a very good place of being successful uh, in, in the exam of what's going to come up. And
this would be the time when I would ask if anyone has any questions. Uh, I'm happy to answer the whole class or I can stay behind if you wish. And uh, before you log out, all I ask is for you to drop your name to the chat so you get the attendance that you stayed a little longer. Like I said, I give credit at the end of the semester for attendance and active participation in the classes. And those will show up on your grade record. Uh, at that time. But that's all I have to share. Uh, really, that's it. And I hope you have a very good rest of the night. I will be around here to answer any questions that you have. But if you don't have any questions, I hope you have a good night. I think that the test is 50 questions, if I remember correctly. Have a good week. And we don't have a class on Wednesday since there's nothing new to share. <laughs> Have a good week. You're almost at the finish line, so finish strong. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a very good rest of the evening and good week. This is our Thanks. last class. This is the last class of proper teaching, yes. So uh, I will be sending some announcements and so on, but we won't meet in person on the finals week. I have nothing to share, but I will be available in case anyone has any questions. That was a good okay. question. <laughs> Thank you, good night. Good night, thank you, bye. Um, Professor, how many minutes on the test? I can look it up if you bear with me. Let me just, 60 minutes. So there's 60. 50 questions and 60 minutes. So they really are not tough questions. You kind of either know it or don't know it. So there should not be a rush to get them done. And I think there's even one control question, which is basically just telling you to choose this letter for this answer. Okay. All right. Good. Excellent. I hope that that helps when you plan for the uh, taking the exam. Okay. And the, the major focus is on 10 and 11, right? 10 and 11. I actually don't think that there's any single question from any other chapters. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. And I'll be sticking around here just for a moment. I'll be taking the attendance. Uh, but if you don't have any questions, just log out. Uh, if you do have questions, you can just shout out. You can type it to the chat. Uh, probably shouting out is easier since I'm still scrolling through the chat. Um, if you want to ask it off record and not being recorded, you can just let me know and I'll stop the recording as well. But that's it for tonight. Hey, Professor. Yes, can I help you? Uh, this is Donovan. I just wanted to say uh, I had a great semester. I'm really looking forward to finishing things up. And uh, I also have my next semester classes set up. So I will see you in Bio 201 next semester. That's excellent. I'm very much looking forward to working with you. And you'll be receiving from me a little uh, message where I kind of uh, tell uh, how you did on this class and so on, but you have been doing an amazing job and I really appreciate all the effort you put into this class and you have all the foundation you need to succeed on 201. So thank you for having been part of this class. Thank you, you have a good night. You too, thanks.
And I'm simply going to turn off the recording now. Uh, but if you do have any questions, you can always message me and I'll make sure to get back to you. I hope you have a very good rest of the uh, semester and I'll be reaching out with a few messages.